Welcome to Small Arms Solutions. Today we're looking at one of my custom builds. Uh, this is probably, in my idea, an ideal combat rifle. Uh, all the parts on here were hand-selected. I've been asked by many of my viewers uh, to build a gun uh, and, and sell it. And I'm thinking to myself, what would I want to build? Uh, because what's important to me is different from some people. Some people would want to go with, they want as lightweight as possible. Myself, I don't go that route. I want as durable as possible. I want to get the ideal uh, rifle for as far as the better, the best barrel, the best gas system, uh, the better components. Um, I'm, I'm more concerned with a durable and reliable combat rifle than I am, you know, one that's uh, six and a half pounds. So what you see here is what my idea of an ideal combat rifle was. Um, I actually looked into building this for you guys. Uh, I looked into it. The, I got the cost down a little bit, uh, but you know, what, you, what you're looking at here is some of the best parts in the industry, and they're very, very expensive. To build this rifle, you're probably looking at well over two thousand dollars if you were to buy these parts, you know, through Brownells or you know, or wherever else you wanted to buy them through. Uh, I will say that most parts that you see here are available on Brownells. If you go into the notes of this video, you will see a complete list of pretty much everything on here. I think pretty much everything on here is available where you guys can get you can get the parts. I sort of decided against building it due to the fact that uh, it gets very complicated because, you know, trying to get source parts uh, as an OEM, you know, you get an order in for a rifle, you know, one of these companies may or may not have these parts in stock. So you know, here I am holding on to somebody's money or whatever for an indefinite period of time, uh, to, you know, to provide them with a rifle. And I used to decide I didn't want to get, in, get into that. So I figured I would show you what my idea of ideal is. Uh, and that's exactly what you see here. To me, uh, this is a perfectly balanced rifle, uh, the gas system, uh, utilizing a mid-length gas system, um, utilizing a hammer forge barrel. We're going to go you know, through the parts from butt to muzzle on here. But um, my ideal rifle will be a mid-length gas system, and it will be a 16-inch barrel. Uh, I do prefer the 16-inch barrel over all the other ones because ideally for ballistics with the 5.56, this is pretty much optimal. Uh, there's nothing that this thing will not do uh, that a 20 inch barrel will do out to four or 500 yards. Uh, so your practical combat range, this is this is ideal, and you're going to get enough velocity uh, where your, your bullets are going to perform like they're supposed to. Uh, you go much shorter, you start losing velocity, your bullets are not going to be nearly as, as uh, well, first of all, not going to be nearly as accurate, but worsely, uh, for as far as terminal performance, you're going to lose a lot of terminal performance. So I do believe that the 16 inch is the ideal barrel length. And when you watch this, the, the, the shooting aspect of the video, you will see that when this thing is fired, that it is perfectly balanced. It does not move. The gas system is tuned correctly. It's not overgassed. Um, everything, is, everything is just where it needs to be. So I think what I want to do is I'm going to go over this rifle from butt to muzzle, and I'm going to show you all the parts that I chose. I'm going to describe you why that I used them uh, and why I felt that they were the best. So starting in the rear, uh, we have the Voltor Mod Stock. I do like this stock quite a bit. The only problem I ever have with it is because, you know, you can see I got whiskers here and they tend to get caught in here on occasion. But uh, other than that, you have uh, the, the shape of the original Colt uh, advanced combat rifle, the triangular shape. It's similar to that of the, uh, the SOT mod stock. So this is probably a, a quarter of the cost of the SOT mod stock. Uh, very durable. Um, this particular stock I'm familiar with because when I worked at Colt, uh, this stock was utilized on a lot of the Colt rifles because it went through all the drop testing, and it did extremely well. It's a, it was a very, very durable stock. Now, the receiver extension on here is also Voltor, and on top of here, you have a hole, a hole right here where you have one, two, three, four, five. Uh, so it tells you what position that you're on. So that's a, that's a neat little feature. Uh, this is a six-position six receiver extension. Now, the end plate that we have on here is a Voltor Sace. Uh, it takes the uh, HK style hook, as you can see right here. It is, it is of course, uh, staked in place. Uh, I'm right-handed, so this was ideally where it needed to go. Uh, so that was perfect for what my need was. Now, any all my builds will all have the Magpul Myad pistol grip. This is the most comfortable pistol grip on the face of the earth, for as far as I am concerned. Uh, I got the, the larger components on here just because of the size of my hand. Uh, you also do have inside of here... A compartment where this one here is set up for a couple batteries, I believe. But you can get ones that also are going to have oil bottles and whatnot. Now, the lower receiver, this is probably one of my big things. This, I feel, is the nicest lower receiver on the, in the industry today. 
this particular one was manufactured by AXTS uh, a few years back. It's called the ADAC. Now let me give you a little information on uh, AXTX. A AXTX is now Radiant Firearms. Uh, they, they switched over their name. Uh, but they make the exact same one. What ADAC refers to is when you push in the magazine release, you hold it in place, you pull the bolt to the rear, it works as a bolt catch. Now, the whole point of that is, is if you were to have a malfunction, you push in the release, you drop the magazine, and holding it in, you don't have to worry about fiddling around with the bolt catch. It locks it open. And I think that is an excellent feature. Uh, I'm, that's, that's what the ADEC actually is. You also notice you have a uh, bolt release on the, on the top here. Now, this is a bolt release, not a bolt catch. By just pushing it on the magazine release, there's your bolt catch. Works very, very, very easily. Then you have the bolt release. Now, if you look at the bottom here, you're going to see a very flared magazine well. You're going to see that the trigger guard is is, is part of the the, the, forge, the forging. So, it's oversized, works good with gloves. The beveling gives you uh, a little bit easier for inserting magazines, low level to no level light. The safety that you see on here is also uh, manufactured by Radian or AXTX, and it is extremely comfortable. Uh, it's longer on the on the left hand side. Now you could switch this over. Say you were left handed, you could put the longer side on the on the right side. Uh, but this is an uh, this is an awesome uh, awesome safety. Uh, like like a lot, it's very very high profile. Now looking on the other side, you'll see an oversized mag uh, bolt release. Uh, you see how much larger that is. That makes it much easier when you have gloves or uh, you, you, know, you have you have wet hands or whatever, being able just to, to strike that. You also have an extension on the bottom here for the paddle, so it makes it much easier for you to be able to push inward to lock your bolt to the rear. You will see we also have an ambidextrous magazine release. Everything that you would need. This is a it's a fully ambidextrous rifle. Now the trigger we'll get into in a little bit when we open it up. Now the charging handle that I chose on here is also manufactured by Raptor, or uh, at that time it was AXTX, and that is the Raptor charging handle. It's fully ambidextrous uh, on either side. If you also notice, it's rather large, so you're able to pull back like so, left or right-handed. Um, I find this to be an extremely well-made charging handle, very, very durable and very, very reliable. So I'm actually quite fond of that. Now the upper receiver is the manufactured by Voltor, the uh, the the Muir, the M U R, and you'll notice uh, we do have a forward assist. Now the forward assist is one thing, unfortunately, is no longer available. This forward assist was manufactured by Iron Viper. Uh, Iron Viper still manufactures um, a similar one, but not the same uh, pattern. This was my favorite one. It, uh, it's it's manufactured from steel. It's not not crap metal. Uh, it has a good a good pattern on the, on here, so your hand's not going to slip off of it. Uh, I'm very, very fond of this one. Of course, you do have a shell deflector. Now, of course, this receiver does come where with, uh, you can have no, no forward assist if you chose. But I chose to have the forward assist on here just for the sake of having it. I'm not really a fan of the forward assist, but it's it's on there. Very well sculptured upper receiver, uh, manufactured by Voltor. Uh, you'll see quite a few Voltor parts on here. And we're going to go into the bolt carrier in the, in the trigger group in a minute. We're just going to go through the rest of the stuff on the outside. Now, the as we discussed earlier, you have we have a mid length gas system, and why do I have a mid length gas system? What the mid length gas system does is it corrects one of the issues that the carbines do have. Carbines that have a shorter gas system, when you have a shorter distance between the chamber and the uh, gas port, the shorter that is, the higher pressure that you have, and the higher pressure that you have, you're driving your gas system to work a lot faster, and especially after the guns get a few thousand rounds through it, you get some gas port erosion. Uh, it's letting more gas in there, and eventually that can raise your cyclic rate. For instance, with a standard carbine gas system, uh, within 6,000 rounds for the military specification, you have a cyclic rate at the beginning of 750 to 950 rounds a minute. After 6,000 rounds, your upper limit will rise to 1,025 rounds per minute. So that shows you how much of a difference that just having uh, gas port erosion will do um, in, in a short 6,000 rounds. So you figure you have higher pressures to begin with, uh, with a shorter, the shorter gas system. You get higher pressures, the bolt's opening up sooner. Eventually that's going to cause you problems with extraction, and your extractor's going to have to work a lot harder. By having a mid-length system mode, a mid-length system is, is it puts you on a nice sweet spot in between that of a carbine and a rifle. 
So it's a, basically like a, like a nine inch versus a seven inch uh, gas system. The most important thing that that does is it increases your dwell time, which your dwell time is the amount of time that the bolt is closed, which allows the pressures to drop. So when the bolt does start to unlock, you have less uh, residual pressure, so it makes for easier extraction. Uh, so that is the reason why I'm a, I am very fond of this of the mid length gas system that was developed by Mark Westrom out at Armalite. Uh, this was uh, this was his baby. So any rifle that I build uh, will have that mid length gas system on it. The handguard I chose here is manufactured by a former Navy SEAL. Uh, his name is Maya Leclerc. He owns Centurion Arms. Now the C4 rail is also one of my favorites because it's free floated, and it attaches right to the barrel nut. And then you have a couple screws up here. You have a full free-floated barrel. Uh, nothing is impeding on the barrel at all. So no matter what you hang on here, it's not going to impede on the barrel's harmonics. It's not going to bend the barrel down. The front sight base is also one of my staples. Uh, this is the Arms 41. Uh, this is a really neat front sight base because when it to fold it, you just push down and fold it in place. And then with one finger, it engages it. Now when it's engaged, you have that triangular shape, uh, which you know the, the rifle is sort of the silhouette that it's known for. And this particular model uh, is pinned in place. This can be gotten in a couple different versions. One where you'll use a, a bolt or a screw uh, to, to lock it in place. Uh, I tend to prefer drilling and pinning, as you guys hear me say all the time. So when I built this rifle, this rifle was sent over to Monty Leclerc at uh, Centurion Arms. I sent him everything, and he, dr he drilled and pinned uh, the front sight base for me. The barrel on here. I chose a FN hammer forged chrome plated barrel. And the reason why I did that is because, in my opinion and in my experience, cold hammer forged barrels will last longer than a button cut barrel. But we have to qualify this. It's been my experience that the hammer forged barrels will last longer and they're more durable than a button cut barrel. However, I have to give the accuracy edge to the button cut. And where that comes from, this is the same reason that the Army, for all these years, would not allow a hammer forged barrel on the M16. The uh, Rock Island had claimed, in fact, Jan Hillen's name was Lauren Brunton, he claimed that the reason why he would not, they would not accept a hammer forged barrel is because a mandrel, you will not be able to duplicate the leading edge on the rifling, which is what they view as one of the keys to the accuracy of this rifle. But that particular leading edge could not be duplicated uh, in the hammer forge. So, what do we have here? So now we have a balance between precision accuracy versus combat accuracy and a barrel that would last longer. So, in my opinion, uh, the cold hammer forged barrel for an assault rifle, for a combat rifle, I think is a better barrel than a button cut. Am I feeling like I'm outgunned or I'm having a problem with, uh, or I'm at a loss with a button cut barrel? No. Um, I think there's just enough of an edge that makes this a little bit better that I would choose one over the other. Um, I have plenty of button cut barrels. I have no issue with no issue with them at all. I just tend to like the performance and the longevity of the hammer forge just a little bit better. Now this is a, a flash suppressor is by Voltor as well. Now normally I would have a Smith Enterprises Vortex on it. At the time I built this rifle, I did not have one on hand, which is the reason why this is on here. And one of these days when I when I get uh, a chance. This will come off, and I will put the, the Vortex on. And the reason I put the Vortex on is, in my opinion, in my experience, I think the Vortex is the most effective flash hider in the industry. Uh, I've tested them myself outside at night, various times of night uh, over the years, and there's no question in my mind it's, it, it's the finest. This does a great job, absolutely. But, again, I'm looking at ideal, the best-case scenario of everything, and even if there's a slightest edge, I'm going to go with it. So normally I, I would definitely put a Vortex on it, but I would have no problem with uh, this one either. You will see I have my Mansa Rail Protectors on here as well. And you guys know we have a code uh, that you can go in there. It's uh, SACE20. And you can get 20% uh, off of, of any order that you put in. Now, I chose these for another, another reason. These are not just rail protectors. As this rifle gets, you know, as you shoot it and it gets hot, this will conduct heat uh, from the receiver forward. This handguard will get hot. So you definitely want to have something to protect your hand. Now, these don't just protect the rail. These protect your hand. Um, I have actually put the suppressor sleeve on a sound suppressor and fired off 90 rounds. I was able to hold it by this material. This is a uh, proprietary material. It's got a good rubber feel to it. So if your hands are muddy or sweaty or whatever, they're not going to slide off of it. 
Uh, and no matter how hot this gets, you're not going to feel it in here. Uh, this could be probably a good, you know, 140, 150 degrees. This is going to be probably in the 70s. Uh, it, it's an excellent, uh, it's, it's by far the best, um, rail protector in the industry. Uh, it's used on the IA, the IAR program for the Marine Corps. We have a Tango Down Vertical Pistol Grip. If you also notice, I have a uh, Mantis Sleeve on here as well. Uh, one of these days I plan on putting a flashlight on here, and that will slide right into here, the uh, the, the pressure pad. So I got a good grip, good firm grip on there. And of course, we have to have uh, O to the Republic. God bless Texas. The optics I have on here is the Arms Number 78 Tits Mount, which you push forward and it goes down to the left. Now, many, most of the time these will go to the right. Um, it is my preference to go to the left. I do it this way because you're not going to get uh, gas uh, on the front of the lens here. So that's one of the main reasons that I put that here. Uh, but you can put it either way. And what we have here is the Aimpoint Comp 2 uh, mil spec um, red dot sight. Now this is the original version which has the battery compartment on the top. The, it was later changed to have the battery compartment on the bottom. That was a request of the U.S. military. In the rear, I have the Arms 40L uh, backup sight, which I do have two apertures on here as well, a short range and a long range. This is adjustable for windage only. So that is the optics I chose, and they're on all on Arms throw lever mounts. Now we're going to take a look on the inside of this thing. We're going to start looking at the bolt carrier and the trigger group. First, we're going to take a look at the bolt carrier group. Now, also, many of you who've watched me know the fact that I am particularly fond of chrome. Uh, I, I like chrome better than any of the current wonder finishes that you see out there. I prefer it over the nickel and, and everything that's out there. Um, this particular bolt carrier group was manufactured by Smith Enterprises. Now, Ron Smith has been manufacturing chrome bolt carriers since the 80s. Uh, he's probably made more than anybody else uh, in the industry, you know, probably, you know, other than Colt. Now, the reason this was, these were stopped during the Vietnam War was a couple of reasons. One was because of cost, because the chrome plating was more expensive than the manganese phosphate. But number two was there was an issue with these things having a hydrogen embrittlement, which if the chrome wasn't plated properly, but if the process wasn't proper, you could get moisture underneath the plating and it would flake off. And that would, that would cause uh, issues with corrosion. Now, over the years, the chroming process has been perfected, so you don't have that issue any longer. Now, the only thing I probably I might add to this would be a, an LMT-enhanced uh, bolt. Now, I would not put an LMT-enhanced bolt carrier in here because this is a mid-length gas system. It does not have the overpressure issues that a carbine does. So that's why you don't see the LMT-enhanced bolt on this because it is mid-length. I probably would uh, you know, add an uh, enhanced bolt to this because that would be a, a, you know, an improvement. The thing you notice about Smith Enterprises is he does not stake uh, his um, carrier key screws. According to him, he uses Loctite, and he uses the proper 50 to 58 inch-pounds. He says it's not necessary. Uh, he's not the only one that says this. It's also said by uh, Young Manufacturing. The ones that they have, they don't uh, stake those either. Now, all I can say is uh, I'm used to staking. Uh, that's the, It's the U.S. mill spec. So is it necessary? Well, all I can tell you is I've got a lot of rounds through this thing, and there's been no issue whatsoever. So I tend to think no. Uh, it's something that I would continue to do just because that's how I was trained. That's how it's done at the military factories. Again, I would always do it. Uh, but, you know, uh, Ron Smith got it right. You know, you, there's no issues with this. Now, there are M4 feed ramps on both the uh, the barrel extension and the uh, upper receiver. So we do have M4 feed ramps. Now, taking a look at the lower receiver. First and foremost, I have the JP Enterprises silent captured spring in here. What this spring does, it eliminates that boing in, in the stock assembly. You don't hear any of that. This is, of course, semi-automatic only. Uh, I've never tried this uh, assembly on fully automatic, which doesn't really make a difference because this is a semi-automatic rifle. But what a difference this makes in not hearing all that boing in the, in, the, in, the, in the stock. So that's definitely one of the things that I did. Now, the next thing we want to take a look at is the trigger. Now, I'm fond of a lot of different kinds of triggers. You know, I, I have a lot of guys lease, um, but this one here is probably... One of my favorites. First off, I, I prefer single action triggers on a uh, combat rifle. You know, people have different views on that. It's whatever works for you. But I prefer a single stage because I'm able to get shots off a lot quicker. This one here 
is awesome. Uh, you can actually adjust the weight of this by these toggle springs. Let me give you the reason for these toggle springs. When you lighten up a trigger, one of the first things you go after is your hammer, your hammer spring. And if you lighten that up too much, you, uh, you're at risk for misfires because you're not going to have enough energy to set off the, uh, the, the primer when it, when it strikes the, the beast or by the firing pin. So what this gentleman did, uh, his name is Terry Bender. He is literally a rocket scientist. That was his job. He was a rocket scientist. Um, he had these two toggle springs, so you could lighten up the trigger without having any effect on the actual force going forward to strike the, uh, the firing pin. So you can lighten up the hammer spring quite a bit to get that really light, uh, nice trigger pull, but you have these springs. Now, by changing out these springs, you can go, you know, I think it's like a half pound increments. Uh, you can go, you have a uh, heavier and a lighter. I think this is sort of the middle, the middle ground right here. But the trigger pull on here is just absolutely beautiful uh, for, for rapid, rapid shots. It uh, works out really, really well. Uh, but that's what my pick is on that. And as you can see in this receiver, too, just uh, look at the beautiful machining work on it. Um, it just, it's undoubted this is, uh, this is my favorite of anything in the industry right now for as far as lower receivers. It does everything. Fully ambidextrous, um, you know, the ambi bolt, ambi bolt release, ambi magazine release, uh, ambi safety. It does everything. Now, I'm certainly sure any of you guys will look at this and say, you know, you'd like something else better. <clears throat> well, I gave you the reasons why I chose everything that I did on this gun, every single part. And I think all of these are some of the best parts in the industry. And I think together, this, this to me would be an ideal combat gun that I would carry. Uh, we have the strength. We have the durability. We have the rail space. We have literally everything. Um, and again, when you, watch the, when you watch the footage of this thing shooting, you will see the way this thing ejects. It is doing exactly where it should be. It's ejecting them around 4 o'clock. Uh, there's no muzzle, re muzzle rise to this thing. It is just, it, it, this is a, it's a perfectly balanced gas system in this thing. Now, all the parts that you see on here are going to be in the notes in the video. So you will have a, a, a lead where you can go to, to, to purchase any of these components. But uh, there you have it. This is, uh, this, is what my, this is what my ideal would be if I was to build a rifle for you guys. This is what it would be. Uh, it would have all these components. You know, that's, that's something difficult for any manufacturer right now. Uh, you know... There are so many different components for these systems. It's very difficult to build one rifle that's going to fit everybody. That's why companies are smart like Colt and like, you know, LMT, who provide you a basic M4 rifle with regular old mil spec stock and regular old handguards and pistol grip because they know the first thing you're going to do when you get it is you're going to choose what rail system you like, what flash suppressor you like, what trigger you like, what stock you like, and then your optics and what pistol grip because everybody's different, you know, as we call these the grown man's erector set. But uh, like I said, this, uh, this rifle is, is my idea of pretty much perfection. And now we're going to take this to the range and we're going to see how it shoots. One of the interesting things about the ADAC is you're able to lock the bolt open without touching the bolt catch. You push inward on the magazine release, pull back, and locks the bolt to the rear. I give this 50 round drum a try.
you know, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to leave me a comment. I hope you guys did enjoy this video. If you did, please click like, please subscribe, and even better, share.